I'm glad to be here. I appreciate it. Wallace is the one who actually asked me to speak, and I hate that he's not here with us. Um, and I hate that I can't be with you guys and actually hug you and, and see you. Um, my name is Kelly Anderson, and I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is December 12th of 2012. I am a member of the Primary Purpose Group of Wilson. We meet every Monday and Thursday nights. Monday night is a big book or a step or a tradition meeting. Um, and every Thursday night is a, um, is a speaker meeting, just like you guys. Um, so I think that's all for the housekeeping. I promised you I am dressed. My sponsor told me to make sure I'm dressed. So I'm not in my pajamas, I promise. Uh, just want to get that out of the way so Pam doesn't jump on me. Um, so I was supposed to tell y'all in a general way what I was like, what happened to me, and what I'm like today. And so I will try to do that without staying drunk too long. Um, I was born in Pennsylvania. Um, we were talking earlier. I'm Brad and, and uh, a few others of us um, from northeastern Pennsylvania in the Pocono Mountains. Um, I grew up there, um, spent my entire childhood up there, um, but it was grounded in chaos and during it most of the time. Um, I spent a lot of time at, at um, coffee clutches where there was no coffee involved. Um, <laughs> spent a lot of time um, being drugged back and forth to different people's houses and and just, just chaos. Um, you know, I can't take my mother's inventory, but, you know, you know what they say. <laughs> it walks like a duck, talks like a duck. It's probably a duck. Um, so I took my first intentional drink that I remember consciously making the decision to do at um, eight years old. Um, you know, it was all around me, and that was perfectly normal behavior, and I wanted to be happy like everyone else was happy. And so... I started drinking when I was eight. Um, 14 is when I started drinking daily. Um, when you're in the mountains of Pennsylvania, there's really nothing else to do. <laughs> um, you know, there was alcoholism that ran rampant on both sides of my family, my mother and my father's side. Um, so I don't know if I was predisposed to it or not. I don't fall on either side of the fence on that, but I am what I am, and, and I'm an alcoholic. Um you know, got through school, you know, we grew up in a really, I grew up in a really rural area and, um, we didn't have a whole lot of money. We were, we were dirt poor. And, um, yeah, I, I remember eating chicken and dumplings when there was no chicken. It was just dumplings. <laughs> so, you know, we really didn't have a whole lot and, you know, my mom made my clothes and so I got picked on a lot and I was bullied a lot and, the result of that was I just, I just, I became a loner. I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't, you know, interact with anybody. I had a really hard time socially. And the only thing that I found that actually helped that um, when I was with my peers was drinking. And so that's what I did. Um, there's lots of other outside issues in my story, but out of respect for Alcoholics Anonymous, I'll stick to the alcohol tonight. Um, but, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time alone and ashamed of who I was. And, you know, just I think I've heard every alcoholic say it just about and I, just out of place. You know, I didn't belong anywhere. I wasn't normal by most people's standards. Um, so, you know, my alcoholism just kind of was in very fertile ground. Um, you know, everything that I did revolved around that, uh, you know, school, I would take it, take it to school with me in a, in a drink bottle or, you know, whatever I could find. Um, and that's how I made it through school. Um, my mother moved me kicking and screaming to North Carolina, to Wilson, North Carolina, halfway through my junior year in high school. And I didn't like any of the people I was around up there, except for a select few but I darn sure didn't want to be down here around a bunch of people I didn't know. <laughs> so she drug me kicking and screaming 
Um, halfway through your junior year in high school, when you've grown up around the same people your entire life, is is traumatic. Um, I was angry. I was full of fear. I didn't fit in anyway, and having to fit in a brand new city, you know, with brand new people, was just overwhelming. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time alone. Um, I had to figure out where I was going to get my alcohol from because I still wasn't 21 and moving down here. I didn't know anybody. So that was an issue for me. Um, but I quickly, you know, we kind of tend to gravitate towards one another. So I quickly found people like me um, who could get me what I wanted. Um, but, you know, I, my entire high school life was, was basically centered around alcohol and that's the only way I could function. That was my only coping mechanism for anything. It's all I ever knew how to do. Um, I wasn't real good at, at expressing my emotions. I wasn't real good at at feelings. You know, I didn't. I didn't. I don't like them. I still don't like them. <laughs> I'm not good at them. Um, but uh, you know, just when you grow up in that kind of chaos, it just seems perfectly normal to continue it. Um, and that's what I did up until about 1994 when I met my husband and I was running crazy and, you know, being insane and just doing what we do. And (laughs) my husband is a law enforcement officer, career law enforcement. So, um, I had to kind of tamp back my drink in when I met him and he, really didn't know what he was getting into because <laughs> it wasn't that bad. You know, it was manageable at that time. Um, he had two girls from a previous marriage um, that were nine and 12 when he and I met. And if you have children, 12 years old is a very difficult age. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was raised by my stepdad who instilled, you know, good values in me. And, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be the best step parent I could be. And, you know, just because I loved him and, you know, he, he modeled what I wanted to be. And so, you know, here I have this nine and 12 year old and I'm trying to be the best step mom I can be. And they didn't like me, (laughs) you know, and I, I didn't know how to deal with that. And so, yeah, it, my, my drinking really took off. Um, you know, it, it took me a long time to understand that they weren't required to love me. And I wasn't required to love them. It was just, you know, something that I really, really wanted. And it just wasn't going to happen. Um, so I, I buried those feelings and those emotions in alcohol like I always did. Um I had a prescription drug problem at that time as well. Um, again, out of respect for Alcoholics Anonymous, not going to go there, but um, that took off too. Um, so it was a recipe for disaster. Um, so I spent those next few years um, until the girls were um, out of the house. And, uh, you know, it, it was all just kind of a blur. I was... I was dealing with stuff the best way I knew how. And of course, the only, like I said, the only coping mechanism I had was drinking. And so that's what I did. And it got progressively worse. And my husband started to realize that, hey, you know, a few drinks on the weekend wasn't really what he signed up for. You know, this, that, that's what he signed up for. That's not what he got. Um, so, um, you know, it just, it just got crazy from there. Um, in 2000, my daughter was born. Um, she's adopted. Uh, she is actually my oldest stepdaughter's first child. And um, I was unable to have children of my own. And so, you know, she she ended up with us at three months old and um, ended up staying with us. And so she was my little gift from God. You know, that that's what I call her to this day. She was my gift from God. And um yeah, I really didn't want to raise her the way that I was raised. Um, that was that was one of the things that I just didn't want to do. I didn't want to be like my mom. 
And, you know, we say we're not going to, we do one of two things. We end up exactly like them or we end up going the opposite way. And, you know, I ended up exactly like her, um, in 2000, let me back up a minute. My daddy who raised me, um, got sick and, um, Give me a minute. <laughs> he got sick in 2006. Um, in 2000, August 14th of 2004, um, I woke up on my bathroom floor, which is where I like to lay anyway because it's tile and it's nice and cool. And anybody who has a tile floor knows that when we're drunk and we want to lay down, tile is good because it's nice and cool. And so that's where I ended up most nights. Um, I didn't drink socially. I drank to um, get drunk. There was a purpose. Uh, the purpose was to drink, get drunk, blackout. I was a horrible blackout drinker. Um, so I, I never knew, you know, I'd get up the next morning and I'd never know how the night had gone. <laughs> but I could always tell because my husband would get this look on his face like a two-year-old pouting and would stomp through the house. And so... <laughs> I would know the next morning whether I had been really bad or really good. It depended on the way he was walking and his face. Um, but he, uh, in that particular night, he had in the past kept Rainy, my daughter, from, from seeing me, from finding me on the bathroom floor. And I think he had just had enough at that point. And I was laying on the bathroom floor and I looked up and, and she was looking at me. And started crying. I was like, Mommy, what's wrong? And, and so, yeah, I looked up at her, and in that moment, I knew that she was seeing what I saw when I was younger, when I was her age. And it just, it, it broke my heart. Um, my husband had been after me for probably two years to go to rehab. And I kept telling him, no, I wasn't going because my daughter needed me, and I wasn't leaving her. What I didn't realize at that time was that I wasn't there anyway. You know, I was, I was there physically, but emotionally and, and giving her any kind of, you know, emotional support at that time, I, I couldn't. It was beyond me. And so I was there, but I wasn't really there. And um, so she finds me August 2004 on the floor. Um, you know, at that point, I feel like, you know, I've disappointed her. I've let her down, and I've pretty much spit in God's face because here he gave me this beautiful child, and I blew it. So I was, you know, in a very dark place, um, someplace that I don't think I ever want to go again. Um, you know, I sat at work in the back parking lot at my job with a nine millimeter in my hand and I was ready to blow my brains out. And here's a God thing for you. Um, at that time, my sister was babysitting my daughter and I got a phone call. We had Nextels back then with the little two way radio thing. And I had it on the seat beside me and my Nextel beeped and the receptionist out front at work had told me that my sister and my daughter were out front. So here I am sitting in my car, in my truck with, you know, a nine millimeter in my hand fixing to blow my brains out. She calls me and says, your daughter and your sister are up front. And I immediately get angry because they were interrupting the process. <laughs> that today, it, it just blows my mind that I even felt that, you know, but. So I go stomping up front and I'm like, well, what do you want? And my sister looks at me and says, well, you know, chill out. We were driving by and Rainy said, I want to stop and see mommy. Now that child had no reason that particular day to want to stop and see mommy. They just happened to be at the store down the road from me and drove by my work. And she said, I want to see mommy. So you know, that was God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself through her. Um, so I went to rehab, <laughs> needless to say. Um, you know, I got up off that bathroom floor and I looked at my husband and I said, it's, it's, you know, it's time to go. It's time. I can't, 
do it anymore. And so off I go to rehab and spent 28 days there and, you know, came out on fire for Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, you know, when I, when I got sober the first time, I, I pretty much did exactly what I did when I was drinking. It's either all or nothing with me. It's either I'm going to do it 110% or I'm not going to do it at all. And that's exactly what I did with Alcoholics Anonymous. So I came out and, you know, I found a home group and found a sponsor and 90 meetings in 90 days and did everything they told me to do. And everything went well for a long time. Um, And uh, in 2006, my dad got sick, and he fought the good fight for two years, and I lost him in 2008. And the home group I was in at the time was not a three-legacy group, was not a structured group, was not close. We weren't a close-knit group. And so, you know, I had been around enough AA to know at that point that, you know, you show up. You show up for people, um, and nobody showed up for me. And, you know, on top of the hurt and, and the fear and the anger that I was feeling from losing him and then them not showing up for me at all, you know, I, I, I left. I left Alcoholics Anonymous. And rather than finding another group, which there are plenty, I just I checked out. And... Uh, you know, at the time I was working 14 and 15 hours a day, and I used that as an excuse not to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I had been sober a good little while, and, you know, my husband believed that I could do it on my own, and I believed I could do it on my own. And so that's what I set out to do, because I got this. Now, rest assured, if you ever hear me say, I got this, I ain't got it. <laughs> I ain't got it. Um, so... You know, basically what happened is I left AA the first time in 2008 and stayed sober, um, worked and, and, you know, did, did my thing, but I had lost my conscious contact with God. I had stopped praying. I had stopped talking to a sponsor. I had stopped going to meetings. I wasn't doing anything I was taught to do. And it took a few years. It took until 2012 for me to relapse. But it happened. And I, I believe that it started happening as soon as I left that group because I already had that resentment. And resentment and anger are two of my biggest things. I, I will hold on to something until I just absolutely am ready to explode. And I have learned through Alcoholics Anonymous and you guys that I, I'm, I can't afford to do that. It's not good for me. And I will suffer. <laughs> um. So I left AA, you know, one thing I will tell you is if you get angry, if you get upset, if somebody says something to hurt your feelings, you know, because we're a very sensitive group um, and our feelings get hurt easy. Uh, <laughs> if that happens and you leave a group, find another one. There are plenty out there to choose from. Please don't stop coming because I am living proof that it will get you. It'll bite you um, because this alcoholism doesn't take a break it, it stays in the back of my head 24 7 you know whispering all the time you know it'll be different this time you got this you can change you know, you're all right without them it's okay um but i know that to not be the truth um so june of 2012 um i'm working for a um financial advisor for a company and I go with my boss and my husband to a um, conference in Vegas. Don't let anybody ever tell you that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It does not. <laughs> it will good. follow you home. It does come with you. Um, and I'm everywhere I go. So obviously it didn't stay there. Um, so you know, June of 2012, I'm in Vegas. My husband has gone to Arizona to see some friends of ours. I'm sitting downstairs at a craps table, and I have no idea how to shoot craps. And, you know, had not been drinking, had been sober up until that point. Had been dry, not sober, because I wasn't acting sober. 
But anyway, I'm sitting at a crap table just watching, and the waitress walks by and says, can I get you something to drink? And without a second thought, I said, natural light and tequila. And I don't know where that came from, but it slid out of my mouth just as easy as it had those years before. And so she brought me that drink, and I drank it, and nothing happened. And I thought, maybe I overreacted a little bit. <laughs> maybe I'm not an alcoholic. Maybe I'm cured now. After all these years, I can drink like a normal person. So she walks by again, and I order another tequila and natural light. And so... I drank that one, and again, nothing happened. And I went up to bed that night and went to sleep, and everything was okay. And so now, in the back of my head, the voices are starting. It'll be different this time. You got it. You you drank, and nothing happened. And everything was okay. And so we came home from Vegas, and about a week in, (laughs) I thought, hmm, you know, nothing happened, so maybe a few airplane bottles will be okay. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I started with, with um, vodka, started drinking vodka. And four airplane bottles turned into six, and six turned into 12, and 12 turned into a pint. And within four months, by October 2012, I was drinking a fifth a day at work. We keep it at work, under the counter, in the kitchen at work, so that I had an incentive to get up and go to work. I mean, I say, four months, I was right back where I had started from, and worse, because now I was drinking all day, every day, at my job, (laughs) you know, coming home and drinking at night, but I was hiding it very well. Again, I said my husband is in law enforcement, and he just... You know, this second time, I hurt him worse than I think I did the first time because this time he was like, how could I not have seen it? I was like, you don't understand. I'm a really good liar. (laughs) And I'm really good at it because I've done it for years. And so, you know, it's not your fault that you didn't see it. So, you know... Back to treatment, I go. <laughs> Actually, I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous in October and and white knuckled it. And, you know, alcohol is just, it's so readily accessible. I mean, you can walk in anywhere just about and get it. And I do not have that kind of willpower on my own. I just don't. And so, you know, the good thing is I walked into the primary purpose group of Wilson in October 2012, and I saw a lot of people that I knew from when I was in the A before, and that gave me a lot of hope. It gave me hope that I could do this again. Um, Had a lot of shame, a lot of shame, and, um, you know, I I walked in, and I saw Pam, my sponsor, and I saw Mike, and a few other people who had been there the whole time that I was gone, and, and it was very refreshing and it, and it gave me some hope and that's that's all I needed was just a little bit of hope what I didn't have then was the willingness to stop drinking <laughs> mm. so October November you know I, I'm going to AA meetings and I'm you know trying my best to stay sober and it's just not working and I'm going to meetings drunk and I, I'm doing a book study with my sponsor drunk and I'm passing that on her kitchen table and saying, you know, oh, I'm so tired. Like, she didn't know what was going on, you know, and and just crazy, crazy stuff. And so, you know, by by the beginning of December, I had finally realized that, that I just, it was getting really bad. Um, I lost my job in October. Um because I stole from a client and uh, Bernie Madoff made that very difficult to get away with, (laughs) you know, I kind of looked down on that after Bernie. And so I lost my job and um, which was absolutely the appropriate thing. Um, And that's kind of how my husband found out that I was drinking and then because I came home and with my little box of stuff (laughs) 
and I'm crying and I'm blubbering and I'm a mess. And he's like, what is going on? And, you know, I'm like, uh, you know, here's what happened. And so, you know, cue the anger on his end again. So, which again, you know, was absolutely justified. And, um, so October, November, December, when I lost my job in October, I decided I was going to paint the house, the inside of the house. And so I did a really good job to begin with. <laughs> I mean, I did a really good job, but, you know, toward the beginning of December, it was starting to get a little, a little sloppy. Um, and so my niece at the time was living with us and, you know, I'm painting that day and, and she comes home and she finds me in the bathtub covered in oil based primer. I mean, just from head to toe. I had been slapping on the primer all day long with no nothing rolling it over my head. So you can imagine. Um, so I'm sitting in the bathtub covered in primer, crying trying to scrub it off and she, she was just like what in the world is wrong with you so you know I finally I end up having to take a, a bath in paint thinner literally and that stuff will mess your hair up I just want to tell you so don't ever do that <laughs> it's not a good idea so um anyway after that my, my husband was like Kelly I really don't think that this is going to work maybe we need to consider you know, you going back to Wilmington. And I said, I think that's a good idea. And so I decorated for Christmas that weekend and we called Wilmington Treatment Center. I am alumni <laughs> twice. And so, yeah, you know, I went up there and went back into treatment and left there and drug back into the primary purpose group and asked Pam to be my sponsor again. And, uh, you know, she, she agreed. And this time coming into Alcoholics Anonymous has, you know, the first time it was the, I had the bill experience, the epiphany and the burning bush, and it was fast and yay, I was on fire for AA. This time was excruciating. <laughs> it was really, really hard. And I had more of a, of a, of a Bob experience this time where I just, I struggled really really hard and you know I'd, I'd talk to my sponsor and talk to people in my home group and they'd be like you know just keep doing what you're doing it's gonna get easier and I, I kept hearing that over and over again and you know what I was missing was the whole surrender part the whole you know where I had to just give up and say you know I can't do this and I'm not good at that i'm not good at at you know handing stuff over and and having the faith that somebody else can handle it that god can handle it for me um i had to understand that that i'm not in control i am a control freak i need to know what is going on with everybody all the time and i need to be able to fix whatever problem you have not worried about my problems, <laughs> but I can fix you and you know, not focusing on me um, because that's easier. It's easier for me to do. And so, you know, I, I had for years been the fixer in my family been the one that everybody ran to to fix everything. And, you know, that, that was not good for me trying to be sober because I'm not good at failure either. So, you know, if, if I can't fix it, I beat myself up over it. And so drinking was the only way I knew how to handle that. So getting sober and trying to figure out, you know, what do I do now when my entire life was centered around alcohol and my entire life had been, that had been the only coping mechanism I had, except for that, you know, those, those eight years being sober and you know for those years weren't really sobriety they were more just not drinking um so so trying to figure out how to live 
a productive and faithful life proved to be difficult for me. <laughs> it, you know, trying to trying to allow another woman, especially a woman, into my life and trusting her with everything, you know, with all my secrets and all my, you know, the stuff I was going to carry to the grave with me. Oh my God, (laughs) y'all. I just, I just couldn't do it. Women are, I I love y'all today, but I just can't trust (laughs) y'all to save my life. It, It is tough. It is tough as a woman to be able to trust another woman with all your stuff. Um, but I had to, I knew I had to, because that was the only way I was going to stay sober. And I had experience with that. So, you know, coming in and, and sitting down with my sponsor and, you know, starting to work the steps with her all over again and having a new experience with that, because I had never really, i had had other sponsors and I had done other four steps, but this one was different. This one was, you know, with somebody who, who walked me through the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous, not, not with the 12 and 12, which I have no problem with the 12. I love that book. It's awesome. It's a great, you know, tool in, in my sobriety, but, but the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had never been walked through with the big book. You know, I had, I had done the 12 and 12, but I'd never had the experience of walking through with my sponsor in the big book and having her sit down and read it to me. I was like, why are you reading it to me? I can read perfectly capable <laughs> of reading all by myself. You know, I, I got this. And she was like, no, you're going to sit down and we're going to read line by line and you're going to take notes and you're going to, hi- if anybody knows Pam, you better have a highlighter. Am I right? You better have a highlighter because she's going to want you highlighting and underlining, double underlining and making notes in the margin <laughs> and the whole nine yards. But all of that helped me to learn and helped me to understand the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous because sitting down and reading it by myself, which I had done, you just, I missed, I missed stuff. You know, I just, I couldn't understand because I was taking it out of context and not taking it as a, as a program of recovery, if that makes any sense. Um, So she sat down with me and she took me through the big book line by line and, and, you know, One thing I'm confident of, and if you're not, I hope you will be, when you're working the steps with a good sponsor, you'll find God. There's there's really, that's what I've found. There was really no way that I couldn't have found God through working the steps. It's just, it's a process, and the steps are in order. They are for a reason. And I think that's to, you know, set you up <laughs> to, for a relationship with God. That, that and, and I knew God. I knew about God. You know, I had, I had prayed before the whole, oh, my God, if you'll get me through this, I'll never do it again, please. As <laughs> I'm vomiting into the toilet, <laughs> over the bushes, you know, anywhere. Um, every, I did those prayers. You know, and I'd ask him for stuff and then get mad when I didn't get it, Um, you know, (laughs) stuff like that. But I didn't have a relationship with God. You know, even the first time I got sober, I knew God. I was praying to God and I, you know, I thought I had conscious contact with God. But but the quality of my prayer life today and the quality of my relationship with God today is completely different than it's ever been. And it grows all the time. And I, I am just amazed at how that happened. You know, I sit back some days and I'm like, when did this happen? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just been something that I've been taught and I've learned by example, watching you guys and watching my sponsor, um, you know, watching people in my life, you know, that, that have that kind of relationship and just wanting, wanting to have that as well. So I worked the steps with her and, you know, the first three steps, I knew I was powerless. I had a problem with the dash, (laughs) you know, powerless over alcohol, dash that our lives had become unmanageable. 
I had a problem with the dash because, you know, I had been working and had the house and the car and the kid, you know, husband still had all that stuff. So my life was not unmanageable until I started really looking at it in the fourth and fifth step. But, you know, as I said, I already believed in God, you know, but I needed to concede that I was living insanely, you know, in the second step. So doing the same things over and over and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. And that's what I did over and over again. You know, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. I don't know how many times I said, I'm sorry to my husband. And he just got tired of hearing it. He didn't want to hear it anymore. Um, so, you know, step three, you know, surrendered and re realized that I needed to have the willingness to turn over my actions and my thoughts to the care of God and let him guide me instead of trying to guide myself. Um, which I had a problem with because as I said, I'm a control freak, you know, <laughs> and I got this. So, you know, while I'll pray and say, you know, God, I'm going to give this over to you. Five minutes later, I'm like, well, what are you doing with this? You know, <laughs> you should be doing this faster. Let me help you. You know, let me show you what to do. <laughs> it's just, you know, so I had to, I had to understand that he does things in his time, not Kelly's time. Um, you know, the fourth and fifth step, I had, you know, more action to do. I had to start sitting down and really looking at the chaos that I had wreaked on, on my family and my friends and people who cared about me and, you know, the things that I've done, you know, to hurt other people. So I sat down and I put all that down on paper the way she told me to, as it's outlined in the big book, you know, and I had three columns and then she told me to add the fourth one. And I was like, why do we have a fourth one? And she's like, you'll see. <laughs> so I was, I was like okay I'm a little apprehensive about the fourth column but I'll do the first three and then she was like now the fourth column we're going to show your part in and I was like oh no I had no part <laughs> what are you talking about um so she she showed me that I actually did have a part um and so you know I had to I had to trust her and and allow her to to guide me and show me and explain to me, you know, that I had to clean up my side of the street. And so, you know, I made my list and, uh, you know, six and seventh step, we did the seventh step prayer together, you know, just like we did the third step prayer together. We got down on our knees and, and we prayed together and I had never done that before. And that was weird, but okay. <laughs> it was just, it was strange to me because it was a different type of sponsorship than I had ever had before. Um, so it was, it was a process and it, it, it enlightened me to be able to, um, open my heart and open my mind just enough for her to be able to get in there and work on it <laughs> and, and then show me how to work on it. So uh, in the process of doing that, we went to the sixth and seventh step and she told me I had character defects. And I was like, mm, no, I don't. I'm wonderful. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but she promptly pointed out to me that I was not all that and a bag of chips and that I had stuff to work on. And so, you know, I found out that I was a gossip and I was a cheat and I was a liar and I was a thief and, you know, all those things that we find out about ourselves you know, after our sponsors get a hold of us <laughs> and show us, you know, and tell us, you know, what, what the, what the effects we've had on other people. Um, so, you know, I asked God to remove my shortcomings and help me to, to be the best I could be. And, and by his will, not mine. Um, and I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to, um, allow him to uh, to work on me and uh, so I, I have some defects that I still hold very dear and dear um, <laughs> I, I you know still hold on to some of them and I, I turn them loose all the time and they come back and you know it's a process 
Um, none of these steps are things, except the first one, are things that I've done one time and stopped. Um, you know, I have, I have found for me that, you know, going through the steps, I have to apply all of them to my daily life. Um, not just a few, not just the ones that I choose to, you know, but all of them. I have to apply all of them. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not just something that I, you know, stop doing and, oh, I did step, you know, four and five. So I'm, I'm done with those now and I'll never do them again. Um, I've done several four steps. I've done a couple of mini four steps. <laughs> you know, I've four stepped all over the place and fifth stepped it too. And, you know, that, that's what I have to do sometimes to, um, to clear up my side of the street and to get that stuff out. I have found that um, I have learned through my sponsor that once I give, once I give voice to my fears and, and my thoughts and my, my problems, um, they no longer have power over me. Um, and I, I found that to be very helpful uh, because like I said, I would hold things and hold a grudge and hold on to anger and fear just as tight as I could. And um, nothing good ever comes from that for me. Um, so the eighth and ninth step, I made my list and became willing to make amends. I wasn't ready um, because those are two separate steps. Um, so in the ninth step, you know, it came the time to start making amends. And, you know, I to talk to my sponsor and sat down with her. And, you know, I found out that some amends I really shouldn't make. You know, <laughs> and that's where, you know, the advice of a sponsor is vital to me. Because, you know, I thought, you know, hey, I need to head down the street and apologize to that guy standing on the corner because, I owe him money. She's like, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, so stuff like that and stuff that, you know, I did that might have hurt um, a third party. Um, you know, I'm not going to um, make amends at the expense of someone else, um, not just to make myself feel better. Um, so I had to I had to be guided by my sponsor on that. Um you know, I made monetary amends to my employer. I made living amends to my family and friends. Um, and pretty much they all said the same thing. Just keep doing what you're doing and, and stay sober and, and and just be a good person. Um, just, just all I have to do is do what I'm supposed to. You know, I don't need to pat on the back. Oh, you're being such a good girl. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't need that. I, I just need to do what, what God would have me do. And, and in, his, in his image, you know, the way he made me. So, yeah, and, and I found out, too, that I don't have to say I'm sorry because I've said I'm sorry 50 million times to some people in my life. What, what I have learned to do is say, you know, what can I do to make it right? What can I do to make it better for you? Not for me, for you. Um, I have to take other people's feelings into consideration today, not just my own. Um, so the 10th step, I continue to take that inventory, mine, my inventory, not everyone else's, <laughs> because I can take yours in a heartbeat too, but I have to focus on me. Um, so, you know, I do that daily, and if I've done something that I shouldn't have, I immediately clean that up because that's the way I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous by you guys. Um, yeah, I don't like making amends. I truly don't because I don't like saying I'm wrong. But, you know, if, if I am wrong, I know today that I have to fix that. I have to, I have to make amends for it. But I have that moral compass today. I have that compass inside of me that, that tells me immediately, you screwed up, go fix it. You know, I don't have to mull it around and say, oh, well, maybe I'll wait till tomorrow. There is no tomorrow guaranteed, so I need to do it right then. Eleventh, you know, conscious contact through prayer and meditation. I have to remember to listen, not just talk, um, and give in his time. You know, help others, the 12th step, I help others as much as I possibly can, not just people in Alcoholics Anonymous, but people in my, in my work life. In my family life, you know, I try to help, just try to be helpful, um, you know, and, and be a good person and 
and try to help the next suffering alcoholic. You know, Daniel and I talked about last night how we both do service work in the jails. And um, I'm really missing that right now because, you know, that that was a highlight of my week. And we've been out of our jail down here since probably February. And so it's, it's been a long time and I miss it so much. And one of my goals when I go up there is to make one of the women cry because then I know I'm getting through to them. <laughs> I know I'm hitting something hard if I make one of them cry, but I miss them. You know, a lot of them up there, Daniel and I were talking last night and a lot, there's a lot of turnover in the jails, but, um, you know, there's a select few that are there just about every time you go, (laughs) but, um, you know, one day, one of them's going to show up in our meeting and, and I just keep praying that 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 will happen and that, you know, when they do, I'll be there to, to help them. Um, AA has given me a relationship with God that I never thought possible. It's given me a a conscious connection with him that if I don't take care of on a daily basis, if I miss a morning of prayer, you know, meditation, I feel it later on in the day. And the good part of that is that I can stop. My big book tells me that I can stop throughout my day and just start over, you know, and say, that's what I have to do some days is just stop and say the serenity prayer and just hit it again. <laughs> because, you know, sometimes I get frustrated and I'm by no means perfect and I don't work this program perfectly and I don't, you know, do everything I'm supposed to do exactly how I'm supposed to do it. But, you know, I try and I have the willingness and that's, that's what I have to have today. You know, my life and my family, I have back. Um, some of them I don't really want them, but they're there, and I love them anyway. <laughs> um, you know, I have true friends in Alcoholics Anonymous that I can count on that have my back. That you know, if my sponsor's not available, I can call any of them any time of the day or night, and I know that I'll have support. Um, I've never had that before in my life. Um, I've never had people that cared about me, that cared about what happened to me that would just drop everything for me. Um, and I have that today and I'm truly grateful for that. Um, you know, I have a home group and when I walk into that home group, I'm, I'm truly at home. I belong there. That's my family. And I wouldn't give anything for them. Um, I have peace and freedom today from alcoholism. Praise God. (laughs) You know, I have, you know, some peace in my life today that, I never would have had otherwise. Um, I am truly blessed and forever grateful to you guys and everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, yeah, my, my greatest, the, the best thing today is that I don't have to be alone anymore. And, you know, that's what I tell the women that come into our group and the men. You know, if, unless you choose to, you don't have to be alone ever again. Um, I was one of those people that could be in a room full of people and still feel alone. But I don't I don't do that anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. And I don't have to feel that way anymore. And that's because of you guys and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll be tr- forever grateful for that. So thank you, um, Daniel, for introducing me and Steve for being there with everybody else. And y'all tell Wallace I said hello and I missed him. And I appreciate it and I love y'all. Thank you. Mm-hmm.